Broadway is this little world unto its own. It's so key to the identity and spirit of New York. You know, when you walk into Times Square and you see 50 shows running and the lights blinking and it's just creates this wonderful energy that reverberates throughout the entire town. And those lights went out and those theaters went dark. In December, of, during the rehearsals, we started hearing about this thing happening in Italy, a virus. Yeah, and it felt far away. It felt like one of those things that might show up in the U.S. in like a few isolated cases and then disappear. And then, of course, you know, you just keep hearing more and more and more and, and everybody would be kind of gathered in someone's dressing room, kind of like listening to the news and like, the hell's going on? New York was hit hard. Good friends like in Moulin Rouge, COVID went through that cast and they were felled. I remember walking through the lobby and seeing the dramaturg for the Lincoln Center Theater, you know, spraying Lysol on, on uh, pictures and, and handrails. First it was like, no guests backstage between shows. Then it was, don't do the, uh, the, the signature line after the show. You know, it was like Broadway couldn't do enough to have safety measures. No gathering with 500 people or more. The Broadway theaters in Manhattan will go into effect five o'clock today. And I remember all of a sudden this, my phone just like going insane. Like, wait, what? Like Broadway's shutting down? What's happening? We study these things in history, but uh, to actually be in the middle of one, I, I don't think anyone can, can prepare for that happening. Our entire being is our job. It's not like you, can find, you can't find a job, it's that there are no jobs. This country and this world needs to know about our industry even more, and everyone is hurting. Well, some people just fight their entire career to get to Broadway. So when it's literally like they, they put the ghost light out, they lock the doors, and nobody is allowed in the theater, we, we don't know what to do. My name is Tom Kitt, and I am a composer, arranger, and orchestrator working on Broadway. Well, I was working on a, a few different shows, actually. The musical Jagged Little Pill, for which I'm music supervisor, orchestrator, and arranger, had opened in December of 2019. And I was working also simultaneously on two musicals, Flying Over Sunset, which was to pr premiere at Lincoln Center, opening night of April 16th, 2020, and The Visitor, which was happening at the Public Theater and opening April 15th of 2020. So I actually had two musicals that were going to be opening on back-to-back -back nights in April of 2020. Musicals take a lot of time to come together and to get to a place where you're ready to share it with an audience. So The Visitor, our, our very first developmental reading uh, took place in the summer of 2014. And the very first developmental uh, reading of Flying Over Sunset happened in the summer of 2015. So it's a, a combined uh, over a decade of work. So certainly to have spent all that time and, and created two musicals, two new original musicals that I was so excited about, so proud of, and to see you just get right up to that moment and then have it not happen, it was, uh, it was devastating and it was, it was really hard. It's just a lot to process. And for me, I have been going from creative process to creative process and um, suddenly there's this uncertainty and I also just didn't, didn't know what I was supposed to do in that moment. I, I knew I didn't want to create anything and I would wake up every morning with just this sense of dread and fear and sadness. And it's such a strange thing to think a few days ago I was here and now I'm in this moment. 
We were at a place in the theater where we had moved onto the stage, we had been teching, putting together the work and then adding the, as you do, the orchestra and putting all the cues and images together. And as each day we went along, this shadow started coming over us of this, of this mysterious flu that we had heard about. Um, and people started to be aware of it and every day seemed to get a little darker and darker from the shadow until I would say it must maybe three days or four days prior to our first audience arriving we heard that Moulin Rouge had to close um, down because uh, the company, uh, someone in the company had, had COVID. Then we went another day or two and heard that another show had closed down. So we knew that uh, the shadow was coming closer and closer over our theaters. It was in March 12th, I believe, that our show was to have its first preview. And that was the day that Broadway shut down. No gathering with 500 people or more. The Broadway theaters in Manhattan will go into effect five o'clock today. So it was, you know, four years of work to get to the exact moment where we would have been doing what we were born to do. This is what we live for. And uh, everything comes to a grinding halt. So there we were, squeezed in with a bunch of Broadway musicals that were supposed to open at the same time as us. There was Six, about the wives of Henry VIII. And there was Mrs. Doubtfire. The West Side Story revival was supposed to open. A lot of big musicals. I hope that they will all be able to come back. You know, I live only a few blocks from Lincoln Center, and I haven't wanted to go back, and today will actually be the first time I'm going back in a year, even though I only live four or five blocks from it. Tell me what we're looking at here. Well, this is the poster for my show, which has been here throughout all the pandemic while Lincoln Center has been closed. They're keeping the lights lit. Coming this spring. Coming and going this spring. But maybe the best publicity was just that sign staying there for 12 months of the pandemic and another half a year at least until possibly we open up. The show shut down, and within four days, I flew back to California where my family was. So I left with about two weeks worth of clothes and, uh, and then ended up having to stay for uh, over a month. And in that time, you know, very quickly realized that as long as Broadway was shut down, I couldn't afford the apartment I was living at. I had to negotiate the breaking of the lease of my apartment. Um, and then, it became sort of like clear to me that I couldn't quite stay in New York uh, while, while the work was shut down. But it's been very nomadic and um, not at all, you know, I haven't felt settled for the longest time. A city that never sleeps has certainly become quieter in the pandemic. Many have left people moving out for good to see my fellow artists having to grapple with whether they can stay here, what they're going to do, how are they going to make a living. Um, it's something that uh, income just, just stops. If you don't have a place to perform and an avenue to do what uh, you feel like you were meant to do. So all of that taken away, it's, it's, it's almost unfathomable to have to deal with that all at once. And thankfully, I know for, for, for a lot of people uh, in this moment, there was uh, a possibility to shift remote and to do things from home and, and um, but for we artists <laughs> who uh, everything that we do is about being in venues, being in environments where we are interacting, there's no replacement for that. There's no way to substitute and pivot to something else. But when that's gone, it's really gone. At the time we were being told both by the government and our work and everything that two to three weeks we'll be back. So it almost felt like a fun staycation, you know, then it wasn't back. And then your bank account starts to see that. 
and this was before we had the CARES Act and everything like that. So it definitely went from this like fun staycation to, oh, all I can hear in the city is either silence or sirens. And we don't know what's going on. So there was this worry and this like, you know, you don't want to go up to your roommate and be like, hey, do you have money or are you worried? Because you, you don't want to be disrespectful, but then at the same time, it's like, oh, are we going to be able to pay our rent? Is there going to be rent forgiveness? What, What's going to happen? You would hear stirrings of that, like, oh, this bill is trying to be passed, but it's taking weeks and weeks It's and weeks. And it's like, well, in a week, am I going to have toilet paper? In a week, am I going to have food? <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. Um, I was dance captaining the tour of the Book of Mormon. I was the child guardian on Flying Over Sunset at Lincoln Center. I was the bar manager for Jagged Little Pill. I was in the production of Beetlejuice the Musical. Well, just saying the name. So I was the assistant conductor and one of the keyboard players for Beetlejuice on Broadway. I was the administrative assistant at Hudson Theater. I also worked part-time as the theater operations associate. Um, we made sure that uh, all the patrons got their, their drinks and all that. <laughs> Visually, for the rest of the world, you see the actors. They don't know about the stage managers, the house managers, the assistants to all that, the ushers, the technicians. You have your safety people backstage. Is there pyro in your show? You have the people trained for that. You, it's, it's huge. It is a huge amount of jobs to be shut down. There's a whole community of bartenders and merchandise and facilities, porters. It's not just the actors on stage, but it's all of the creatives who work on these shows and are able to make them happen. And the ushers and the dressers who like literally you would never see a Broadway performer on stage looking <laughs> together or on stage on time if it wasn't for them, you know? The, the sound team, the lighting team, everyone. You can feel forgotten by the rest of the world as a whole. They're not thinking about the people behind the scenes or the people that you're buying your tickets from and stuff like that. They're not, the rest of the world doesn't think about that. They might think, oh, some hoity-toity actors are out of their jobs. Um, oh, Meryl Streep's not working right now, darn. You know, but <laughs> they don't get that the person doing Meryl Streep's makeup, the person who designed Meryl Streep's makeup, the person getting her costume ready, the assistant who's just packing the costumes. Like, I don't, they, the world does not realize how big this is. I heard them with my own ears say that Broadway makes more money for New York than all of the sports teams combined. I heard that, I saw it written down, yet we are invisible. Broadway actually contributes about $15 billion to New York City's local economy and 100,000 jobs. And that includes all of the ancillary things, the costume shops, the, um, the restaurants that are sustained, sustained by that. All, it's a big part of the economy. And when you take all of that foot traffic and all of that uh, coming together away, there's a lot of people hurting. Every time they have all these, you know, things on the news and, and not to take anything away from people who work in the hospitality industry because it's been decimated as well. It boggles my mind when you look at the numbers of what Broadway contributes to New York City. It's more than concerts. It's more than all of it. The arts are one of the main draws that come into New York. And because of Broadway, because of Off-Broadway, because of all of that, that's why the restaurants thrived. That's why, you know, um, cabs. I mean, if you can go down to cab drivers, Uber drivers, hotels, all of it. When you look at like who has a seat at the table with the government, literally you look at every industry and there is no representative for arts and culture. It, there's. There's no one that has a voice in the government supporting us. So why aren't these businesses being helped? I understand restaurants need to be helped. I know transportation. There's so many different components, but what about, what about us? We weren't kind of given the same weight 
uh, as as other uh, components of New York City. And I do not know why. You don't hear about Broadway, I think, because, well, A, Broadway has gotten really expensive. It's expensive to produce. There are unions that escalate costs. And for many people, if they go to see a Broadway show and want to bring their family, they can only afford to go once a year. So I think that it doesn't seem at the top of our list when we're thinking of the casualties of the pandemic. But nonetheless, it was very much at the top of everyone who works there's list. It's their livelihood. Behind the scenes of every show, you may see eight or nine people or 20 people on a stage. There's 200 people in every theater employed on that show. And they all have families, and they all depend on bringing home the, the paycheck. And so it's thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, of people whose lives were affected. And perhaps a bit unfairly, they've kind of been lost in the shuffle and haven't gotten as much mention because people think of it as expensive and expendable. It's not expendable to those of us who depend on it for our daily bread. running show that closed because of the pandemic. My name is Fran Curry and I was the star dresser for the uh, character of Elsa. The job starts out as being about the clothes and then uh, moves into personal care. It's a very intimate relationship. Um, your maid, buddy, uh, you know, waiter, waitress, host, housekeeper, psychologist, any, any, any jacket you have to wear, you, you, you wear it. And it's a, it's a, it's all about communication and creating a good environment for your star, for your artist. Nobody knows what to do with me. So my resume, I have, you know, 24 years of Broadway on my resume. I haven't been able to get a job at all. And I've been hustling and trying and all of that. I would send resumes all the time and never got a response, nothing. And I, then I, I would take classes and they would say, it's all about the filtering system. And I'm old. I haven't had to look for a job like this since I was 25 and I'm 51, you know? So <laughs> it was, you know, I had one interview that I killed. It was awesome. And I didn't get the job. It was like turning off a light switch. It was so bizarre. It was like going from a bright light to pitch black. I've been hustling to try to get a job this entire time, but no one can see us. We are invisible. I look at Australia, all their shows are open. That made me cry. Watching Australia, people are enjoying the theater and my friends are working and here we are. So when it came to cleaning out our dressing room, Gosh, months had gone by. We we didn't even know the show was closing. And then kind of a last minute, couple days notice, we had a phone call saying that the show was closing. And that was really my first time going back into Midtown. And it was really odd to see fellow co co-workers. And the first thing you want to go and do is run up and give them a hug, but we can't. We just have to kind of like smile and wave. And it was quick. We only had like 20 minutes really to clean out our stations. And so, people are rushing to get in in and out. So you, you're quickly passing by. The dressing room is such an awesome place. It's where you really connect with your fellow actors. So it was weird being in there by yourself and not having your family. Um, and knowing that your things have been sitting there for months and months not being used and you're boxing it up to go put under your bed. <laughs> Usually when Broadway shows close, they'll have like a closing night party and it's where like everyone gathers together. You have a huge celebration and yeah, we just, we didn't get that. Everyone had masks on. Um, and then the gentleman who was filling out our paperwork grabbed our bag of costumes, brought them to us and that was it. That was how we ended. And just seeing everything being packed up in trucks, shipped out.
again, like check out these floors, like some wide plank. You have a modern uh, bathroom right behind you that's like integrated into this beautiful old home. I mean, who wouldn't want to hang out here for a whole weekend? And selling it too, like that's, that's important also, but like hanging out is... <laughs> I'm tempted to go in, I'm not gonna do it, but I'm very tempted. I'm the original Iago, so I've been with the show since 2014, seven years, doing the same show every night, uh, eight times a week. How different is your day-to-day -day life now than it was then? Three million percent different. Um, we got the call. I remember just like staring at my wife being like, cool, like what do we do? What do we do now? 30 days passed, 60, 90, 120, and we, we were we were kind of dumbfounded. My wife is also, she works on Broadway, she's a Broadway stage manager, um, and she was working on Beetlejuice at the time of the shutdown. We had just bought our house in 2019, in the spring of 2019, so, um, you know, we had this house that we needed to pay for and we both didn't have our jobs. And it was actually around May where I said, you know, maybe I should get my real estate license. And I actually joined the group that sold us our house, going into a new line of work completely. Now here I am, um, almost a year later, still doing real estate. We have a QR code, and if people who are thinking about buying the house come in, scan it with their phone, they actually get a digital experience in the house. So I'm gonna tell you a little trick of the trade, actually. When we prepare houses and when, when we show them over the weekends or uh, like when we have pr uh, private showings, we actually turn on every single light in the house because it makes it feel more inviting. I wanna say I've spent a third of my time just like in tears. I literally don't know what to do. And like maybe some even like bad days in real estate, I'll, I'll kind of look at my computer screen and, and be like, how did I get here? Why am I here? What am I doing? Broadway was a way of life for a lot of us. I think, you, I think you see a lot of Broadway performers. They were probably either professional performers when they were children, or you know they got their degree, their BFA, their MFA um, in theater. And so you know, some people just fight their entire career to get to Broadway. Some people don't even get that opportunity. So when, um, when it's literally like they, they put the ghost light out, they lock the doors and nobody is allowed in the theater, we, um, we don't know what to do. Because it's all shut down, you can't just go find another job. This is something you've worked and trained your entire life. And with something that you've been doing your entire life, not just your entire adult life, something your entire life, to have that ripped away and to have no sight when it's going to come back. And it's not like you can go call up another theater or another orchestra. It's like stopped. Um, and it is, as most of us artists, our jobs are very personal to us. It's not just a job. And so, yes, our bank accounts are hurting. It's absolutely terrifying, but it is emotionally devastating. One day I'll wake up and be completely fine. And then some days I don't want to get out of bed. Like it is knowing that your industry is completely shut down. Every day I have to re remind myself that I'm, I'm gonna be okay and we're gonna get out of this. I actually went through a slight depression, which I've never experienced before. I think the biggest sign was having a really hard time getting out of bed. And when I would, I would then just go to the couch and I felt like I needed an, a nap at that time too. It really stripped away a lot of my identity and I'm still honestly figuring it out as I go along. I think people just think we're doing this for fun, <laughs> which obviously it is fun. It's amazing. I absolutely love my job, but I don't think a lot of people realize like this is, this is our livelihood. This is how we make money. And also with Broadway, um, it's hard to hear people say like, we'll just go find something else to do. <laughs> it's just like, would you tell that to anybody else? Why do you keep telling that to artists? And that idea of real job has been a thing since I was a kid. Like, okay, great. So you're just going to go sing and dance for a living. Like, that's great. When are you going to get a real job? So it's kind of, as an actor, you kind of, it, it's not new. Mm -hmm. But no, there was 
a whole thing when unemployment was even being uh, negotiated in, a, in our government of like, why can't they just go figure it out? It's, I have been training for this since I was literally five. Like this is a, this is a specialized industry. You don't tell a doctor to like, go get a surfing job. Like you just, why are we different? Just because I have a job that I love doesn't mean that it's not a real job. My dad called me at the beginning of the shutdown last year and he said, you know, I really think that you should learn to drive a tugboat. <laughs> he was like, you know, I don't know why you haven't found a backup career. And I said, the one thing that I've never done on purpose was give myself an option for anything else. Of course, there's been days in the last year where I've thought, okay, if I need to, like, what, what do I go do? And I just keep saying, I, I'm not going to, I'm just not. I've worked so hard that I refuse to let this be what takes me out. In the past, if you don't have a theater job, you get a waitering job. You can't just do that. Most restaurants have like one or two waiters. That's it. Because there's, you know, there's barely anybody eating in the restaurant and, and they already have their waiters. They don't, they don't need another one. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of depression. I'm seeing a lot of stress. Being told that you you, sh you don't deserve aid because we need to protect the restaurant. Like we need to do a movie theater. It, it's, it's hard. It's, yeah, it's been, it just whole, all kind of trickles back to what's my purpose? If, if, who am I? Like, what is my career? Should I find another, find another job? Like, what would I even do? Like, I have that struggle a lot. I don't even know what I would do, but what if this doesn't come back? Nothing can stop a show, right? The show must go on is the saying that everyone uses. So the idea of shutting down was something that I don't think any of us as performers had even thought of as a possibility. Um, so once that happened, it first felt like, oh, what do I do with myself? Like, this is literally all I do every single day. Like, I have nowhere to go. And I remember sitting in my living room until it went dark, just staring at the wall um, with no, no thoughts. I was like, okay. And then I remember calling my mom and being like, I don't, I just don't know what to do with myself. Like, what do I go do? It really felt like, all of us, everyone walked into a dark tunnel and just didn't, we knew that there was gonna be a light at the end, but didn't see it and didn't know when it was gonna pop up. And that was the scary part of, you know, two weeks turns into a month and the month turns into two months, then six months. But once you hit six months, you're like, okay, you know, I'm just gonna strap in for the long haul and just wait until maybe next year, you know? There's the economic side of it, but also a cast like West Side is over 50 people. Just those 50 people on stage, that's impossible. You, there, there's no way that we could have walked through that and someone definitely could have gotten sick. I kiss someone every single night. That's something that we really couldn't make work. Having a profession that was ripped away overnight by nothing you did, which is still hard for me to understand. Um, and at, at, you know, you can't replicate conducting a Broadway orchestra with people that are like family to you. Um, you can be musical and, and make music over Zoom, but you're not having that interaction. Um, also lining up an orchestra on Zoom, please. <laughs> it's a lot. There's full on Zoom productions of things happening that people are getting paid for or paying to see. So yeah, performers are getting work or something at, in, at a small margin, but not a lot of other departments in theater can do that. I have no virtual job. I can't usher a virtual show. What's been tough about this is not only has it stopped us from working, but for many people who were living in New York, it, it pushed us out of being able to live here for some people forever and, and, and some for a certain amount of time. So it has fractured us, I think, in a really big way that maybe not a lot of the country has realized because so many other people just became work from home and it was sort of like hunker down and stay here. For a lot of us, it was like, 
we could only live here when we were working. And so we've been severely displaced. Um, and there are many artists and, and workers in, from the theaters uh, who have left this town and maybe are unsure about when they'll be able to return. Did you have to pivot to something else? What did you do to make money? I rode my savings for as long as I could and unemployment and then like, okay, I have to try to find a job. I have to do something. I have to make a pivot, even if it's just for now. I'm gonna get a job where I get to spend time with dogs. I did apply to the hardware store and the nursery and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't end up working out. It's actually less safe to work in a store. I mean, even, you know, I love bridal. I was like, maybe I should work at David's bridal. I love bridal gowns, you know, I'd love to do that, you know. And I thought, well, who's getting married? Most of the summer was just reconnecting to like activism, the fight for black lives and all of that. I also started an Etsy shop. Broadway themed bracelets, so it's all different phrases. Um, so I picked from lyrics and show things. So I've got one, uh, that says only intermission. I just started a new job on Monday at a pharmacy for pet medication, um, which is cute. I like to think that I'm like saving puppies or whatever, but yeah, working the customer service side of that, I just pivoting again to something a little more stable, I guess, for now. You know, it was not helpful that in the last year, the, the Broadway League, through no fault of their own, you know, it's, it's, it just is what it is, kept coming out with those benchmarks and saying, you know, April. And then we all sat around and said, okay, we can hang on till April. And then they said, June, we all hung on till June. And, and at this point, we finally all reached a point where you just say, you know what, <laughs> until I walk back into that theater and sit down and that check clears my account, there's, there are no more benchmarks to look forward to. The thing about Broadway that's tough is the economics of Broadway are tough. And um, Broadway, uh, pretty much uh, depends a lot on the advanced sales of tickets because that's money in the bank and gives them an idea of how long they will have an audience, not day of sales. So this is a tough, a tough time for almost all shows to come back because they've got to build up pre-sale. Um, and I don't think anybody knows how that's going to happen and how that's going to work. But some shows, I think, are shows that are, have been running a long time are, are tourist-driven. And without tourism in the city, I think that's going to be, uh, particularly in the summer, kind of a challenge for some of the shows. But, you know, we're in uncharted waters again. I don't think anybody really quite knows. You know, when 9-11 happened, it became a kind of badge of courage to go to the theater and support it. And I'm hoping the same thing happens this time. Somebody said, well, you know, theaters can reopen. Uh, you just run at 30%. And one of the producers I know said, yeah, we close at 30%. Uh, we can't stay open unless we're at the very least 80%. So I don't know how they're gonna do it. I've been in the industry long enough to understand that the economics are hard um, in the best of circumstances and it's an expensive, um, a very expensive art form and so there's just no way to make the numbers work uh, without you know having full capacity available. We announced a major reopening. We did it in concert with New Jersey and Connecticut, and we have dramatically lifted capacity, uh, basically to the CDC social distancing guidelines. Broadway tickets go on sale today at 100% capacity for theaters. The shows open September 14th. That's a function of how Broadway operates, obviously. They have to have a play to put on. They're in the process of doing that, but the tickets go on sale tomorrow. Now there is reason to hope again. We can think about re-rehearsing. And we'll have to go back into the, the basement room, work it all out again, and then go back into tech, 
uh, and figure out what we did and maybe make it better, take into account the year we've been through. I'm sure that will color everything. You ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to go go to Broadway? Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. And Henry got a new collar that he wants to wear for opening night with you. It did? Yeah. Henry, go show Daddy your collar. Let me see my doodle dandy. Oh. Oh. Wicked. I love you, my doodles. We have been in rehearsal now for about two and a half weeks, and it's been just incredible, honestly. And the orchestra comes in a week before opening, which would be amazing. I haven't seen them for 18 months. That's okay. okay. Have fun. Everyone was always like wondering, like, when we get back into rehearsal, are we gonna remember it? Are we gonna remember what we did? How to do it? For me, it's like getting on a bike. It, it really was. I mean, yeah, there's things that we have to like get our brain back on the bike, but overall, it was like, okay, here we are. You're not being told the whole story. Remember that. Well, we're all vaccinated. You know, um, and we're just being as diligent as possible. At least majority of the company feels um, as safe as we can feel as possible. Yeah, the partitions are all for COVID. And sound. You know, everyone's always been um, separately mic'd, but the, the amount of partitions, that is a change from COVID. We're gonna go right after popular, at the top of the transition. The energy that we're gonna get from that audience and the community that we're going to feel in that orchestra pit and on stage, it's going to be like a, nothing anyone's ever experienced before. I think we're coming back as different people and we're going to be investigating what we're doing in a different way. And um, it sort of has affected, in a sense, my view of the show and what's important in the show that may not have been there before. So I think it's going to be a really interesting, unprecedented opportunity to be able to refract something differently through something that you started six years ago with one intention and realizing that the world has changed and um, figuring out how, how to uh, keep going and moving the work forward in a, in a way that speaks to us today. I think um, we are a company that fortunately had these monthly Zoom calls, so at least we were in touch with each other and kept in touch. But I think, you know, people are going to have to fit into their costumes again and do exhausting dance numbers and singing. And uh, I think people, I'm going to be Zooming with the gang as of Friday and, uh, you know, as my putting my directorial cap on, I'll have to say, we gotta start getting into shape. And we're gonna have to review the work before. We, we can't arrive on the first day of rehearsal without preparation. We're gonna have to come where we left off and pick up from there. After all that this country has been through, the politics, the upheaval, the mask wearing, the no mask wearing, the insurrection, uh, uh, a show pales in comparison. Half a million people gone. Many of our friends from the theater dead or stricken. If we come back, it will, it will have a new meaning to us. I think reopening is going to be filled with tears. <laughs> I think people are going to be crying. I know I will. I'll just be crying and crying and crying. It's hard to know what it's really going to look like. Are we going to have 100% capacity? Uh, temperature checks? Will you have to be, um, I mean, what will be the vaccination rate at that point? What will be the positive rate at that point? I think that probably your long runners, like Phantom, Lion King, Wicked, Chicago might be the first to come back to show, to draw in audiences, especially non-New Yorkers, to show you it's safe, to show you it's, it's good to be back. And I want to be there. Like I, if Harry Potter is not in the first wave, if you bet your ass I will be in the audience for the first show that is. And personally, for me, I dream of it being wicked. 
uh, which I've seen before, of course. Um, I imagine being in the first audience of Wicked on Broadway and Glinda comes down in that bubble and her first line is, It's good to see me, isn't it? Right before the opening and at the end of the show when she says, we've been through a terrifying time. Oh, we dream of that. We dream of that night, and I think it's going to be for months and months that it's going to be very emotional. There are things that I I have created that I've listened to in this moment that have whole new meaning for me. Um, I remember one of the nights early on in the pandemic. I sat and listened to If Then, and there's a song on If Then called Some Other Me, which is all about imagining other lives that you could be living. We all, we all look at our lives and think, well, this led to this and this led to this, but what if one thing had been a little different? Um, and to just sort of feel that in the moment of what is fated to happen and what is the other version of myself doing um, versus the version of me sitting and being in this pandemic. I've thought about Next Normal a lot in this moment. I mean, Brian Yorkie just wrote most beautiful lyrics in that show and one of the, the lyric that we talk about um, you don't have to be happy at all to be happy you're alive sorry I'm getting um, but it's it's true we have to we have to be happy to be alive we have to look at every day no matter what's happening as a way as a moment that we can do something important that we can help each other that we can speak to one another that we can make change so I'm hopeful that when we come back these important stories, these important words that have been written and the words to come are going to continue to inspire hope, change, um, and that we will be changed for the better having gone through what we've gone through this year. There's no place like home. I just want to, I wanted to be the one to be here to welcome New York and all of the theater goers back to what is, sorry, my favorite show. <laughs> Hey, thanks for checking out CBS and Originals on YouTube. If you want to watch more documentaries, download the free CBS News app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or any streaming device. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here. Thanks for watching.